The journey I want to take you on today is a journey that takes us back 2,000 years. And although it might seem like a story of yesteryear, believe you me, it's a story that's as relevant to us as ever before. We find ourselves right now in the three weeks, three weeks of mourning. And during this time, we think about and we meditate on the difficult times that the Jewish people went through during the destruction of the temple. Two temples, one of the temples that was destroyed about two and a half thousand years ago, and one of the temples that was destroyed just under 2000 years ago. But one thing that we often don't think about is the majority of Jewish history by now has not been in temple times. It has been post-temple times. Because if you take all the times combined between the two temples and the tabernacle, which is the Mishkan that the Jewish people lived in the desert, you'll have a total maximum 1400 years. Since the destruction of the temple, we've been, this year is going to be exactly 1950. 1950 years since the destruction of the temple. And only 1400 years with temples. And yet we dive in so many times every day, God, take us back. We want to bring sacrifices. We want to go to the temple. It's a fundamental part of our religion. But the majority of our history has been without temples, which makes you wonder, how did Judaism adjust from a temple time to a post-temple time? Now, many of you might have thought of that question, many of you might have not, but here's the, the ultimate question that we have to ask. What happened to the Jewish people immediately after the destruction which allowed them to recreate themselves from a destructive force to a constructive force that allowed them to transform from a nation that had just been destroyed and smashed and broken to a nation that could last 1950 years as we speak. And I'll, I'll, I'll make my question stronger. During temple times, Judaism happened in the temple. There was no such a thing as a shul, pretty much. There was no such a thing as community centers. There was no such a thing really as davening. It was very, very small. Only in the second temple at the beginning, they created the Amidah. But that was davening. There was no Talmud. There was no Mishnah. Pretty much everything besides the five books of Moses and the books of the prophets, some of them which were being authored during the first temple era and only finally put into the Bible at the beginning of the second temple, you really had nothing. You had the five books of Moses, a lot of traditions that passed on from sage to sage, but most of the common folk were not necessarily aware of. And the whole center of the Jew Jewish world was in Jerusalem on a mountain, a glorious mountain, the first one built by King Solomon, the second one built by Ezra and Nehemiah and redone by Herod the Great. But ultimately, the whole Judaism was very localized and very, very small. It wasn't a very multifaceted religion. A lot of the mitzvahs that we consider fundamental to what it means to be Jewish, shuls, davening, experiences, chagim, a lot of them were not necessarily played out the same way those days. Yes, the main chagim were there. They didn't really have Purim till the second temple era. Hanukkah was only deep into the second temple era. And a lot of the other days were, were not commemorated. So what happened really in the immediate aftermath of the destruction, because I think if we focus on the specific time, most probably the darkest time in Jewish history, and I'll tell you why. The darkest time in Jewish history, because in the first temple, when it was destroyed, they all knew of a prophecy. 
that was told to the various prophets that in 70 years, we will come back and rebuild. There was a timeline. They had what to believe in. The second temple was a destruction complete, pretty much for the entire Jewish community with no end in sight. Almost like the Holocaust, just in the fact that the temple was pretty much all of Jewry, and it not only destroyed Jewish bodies as it killed hundreds of millions of people, up to a million, but destroyed the very center, the very the Jewish state as well, the Jewish body and the Jewish state. So I, it wouldn't be hyperbole to say that that time was the darkest time in Jewish history or one of. And I'm going to focus with you on one episode that happened during that era and how it could impact your life. Because ultimately, although we are digging in to the past, the past has to be present. Otherwise, it's just a story. And storytelling is great, but that's not what you came here tonight to do. You came here to learn lessons. So there was a sage who lived during the destruction of the Second Temple. His name was Rabbi Yochanan, the son of Zakkai. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. A great sage, but also a political leader. And just before the destruction of the Second Temple, the Jewish community in Jerusalem specifically was extremely political. They were divided into many camps. The radicals who said, let's fight with the Romans who were just outside the city. The pacifists who said, let's make peace, or rather the practical people who let's, said, let's make peace, and a bunch of other opinions in between. And one of the radicals who wanted to burn down the whole city, and they were actually standing guard by the, by the city gates, not allowing any Jews to escape or to negotiate peace or to do anything, because they, they, and they literally burned down storage houses that Jews prepared for the siege. Jews had enough food to prepare for over 20 years worth of food, but these radicals burned it down because they wanted to get these Jews to fight the Romans. Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai realized that this wasn't going to end well. The Romans are going to get sick and tired of the defiance and they're going to burn down the temple. He had a nephew who was one of the radicals, who was part of that group of, you know, hotheads. And he comes and he negotiates with his nephew, his relative, and the, they managed to get him out. How? Because the radicals only allowed people who were getting buried to get buried out of Jerusalem. So Rabbi Yochanan Mazake literally put himself in a casket, made himself act as dead, had his nephew and a bunch of his cohorts carry him out. And then when he comes out of the temple, it comes out of Jerusalem, he's then he walks or navigates his way to Vespasian, who's the Roman general at the time, about to become the Roman emperor. He actually tells him, he says, he greets him, your highness, and Vespasian says, how dare you talk to me like that? And Rabbi Yochanan Mazake says, I have a tradition that our temple is going to be destroyed by a, a, by a king, nothing less than a king. And not too long after that, Vespasian actually gets a telegram or whatever a message that comes from Rome saying that they had just elected him as the new um, Caesar. He goes back to Rome and his son Titus orchestrates the destruction. But at that conversation with Vespasian, Rabbi Yochanan Mazzaki is having this conversation and he turns to Rabbi Yochanan and says, what do you want? What can I give you? And later on in history, some sages were very critical of what Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai said. They felt that he could have asked to spare the whole destruction. But Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai at the time felt that that's not even an option. So he has one medical request regarding a certain sage, Rabbi Tzadok, who had fasted for 40 years, and to take care of the family of the Nasi, of the leader of the Jewish people. But his main request was the following. Tainly, give me Yavne v'chachameha. Yavne, the city of Yavne, and its sages. In other words, allow me to have one yeshiva that lasts. Don't destroy the yeshiva of Yavne. Allow me to take the sages there. Vespasian agrees. 
Not too long after, the temple's destroyed. The ninth of Av, which we're going to commemorate in two weeks from Thursday, 1950 years. That was his request. Yavne v'chachameh. Yavne and its sages. And that's why the title of this of the speech, as you can see, it says Yavne, lessons from a visionary sage, lessons from one of our greatest sages in one of our darkest times. Because what he did in Yavne, first of all, the vision to understand, to, to recreate Jewish leadership, but it's not so much the fact he created Jewish leadership, it's what he did there. Over the next few years, him and the sages that were with him, some of the sages are names like Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Gamliel, etc., world famous sages, recreated Judaism. And what I mean is they didn't change anything that God said, but they, within the structure, within the limits of what they could, they took a Judaism which is localized, which is focused on a place, which is focused and limited to temple, and allowed it to become the most decentralized religion on earth, where pretty much Jews ever since then, have moved to every corner of the earth and managed to recreate themselves. This was a Judaism that could not do anything beyond the Jerusalem's boundaries. And suddenly it recreated themselves to go around the whole world. I'll give you an example of what they did. They created davening. They created services, shachris min chamarit. And what they said is that they're going to correspond to the various sacrifices that were brought in the temple. Ideas like minion. Ideas of, of a calendar. Till then, the calendar was set up that you, every month you didn't know when the new month started. You had to have two witnesses who would go outside, see the birth of the new moon, go to the main Beth Din in Jerusalem, testify that they saw a new moon, and Rosh Chodesh was announced. It was a laborious process. They took it all out. We have a calendar. Interesting, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Pretty much all the denominations of Jews, Orthodox, Reform, and Constructionists, we don't agree on anything. There's one thing that every denomination of Jews agrees on, the calendar. When was the last time you heard a Reformed temple announce that Yom Kippur this year is in June? Or they've changed the calendar? Nobody. They might not keep Yom Kippur like we keep it, but the Yom Kippur is always the same day that we, the Orthodox, set in our calendar. Rabbi Gamliel of Yavna, the whole group of people, set up a calendar that till today is interesting that no matter how many divisions we've had, we've never fought over the calendar. Everyone agrees what day of the year, of the secular year, Rosh Hashanah is going to be. Nobody's arguing that. It's interesting. So that's just one thing that they changed, that, they, that instead of making it each month a whole process to figure out where Rosh Chodesh is, they created a framework in, through which we can now figure out the calendar for the next 5,000 years, easily. If I have a Hebrew calendar app on my phone. I can now go back 100 years and see when Rosh Hashanah was in 1910, and I could go forward 100 years and see when Rosh Hashanah is going to be in 2120, it's simply because he created a formula. And that formula of the calendar was probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest revolution they created. Because now, once the Jews have a calendar that's consistent and mathematical, we could go anywhere and recreate it. So they took a Judaism that's inflexible and they made it flexible. So the first lesson that I want us to walk out, obviously the tragedy, the three weeks, the destruction, this is the Western Wall that you can see, and we, and we mourn the destruction. But the first lesson we can learn of what we can do, what allowed us to blossom, what allowed us to go from destruction to a brand new beginning, is to see with new eyes, to see deeper, to see bigger. And that's my first lesson that I want to unpack with you tonight. Most of us don't run massive companies. Most of us are not successful political leaders, as if it sounds like a bit of an oxymoron, successful political leaders. Most of us don't usually have to think so big. We think about our days, we think about our weeks, we think about our saving our money. 
But this idea of broad, big thinking, it sounds like university professors. But there are times in life that we have no other choice other than to think big. And to think big means to think beyond the moment, to think future, to think past, to think present, to allow ourselves to go and have a vision that's wider than my nose. Because unfortunately, often all we see is this, this deep. I see my house. I see my needs. I see the shopping I have to do this week. I see the job I have to get done this week. But vision, eh, that's for theoretical. But today, in the day of COVID, and in our time, if we don't allow ourselves to see big, to see deep, to plan, to strategize, what's our life going to look like post-COVID? What's our life going to look like in COVID? Where is the world going? Am I just a follower or am I going to help the world go somewhere? Am I just floating with the water or am I actually the lifeguard who's helping people navigate where to go? But unless I know how to think, unless I know how to dream, unless I have vision, I can't offer that to anybody. What can I offer people? Solace, a hug, I can't even give that. Over the past few months, I've tried different strategies, what to tell my community, what to tell myself, what to tell my family. And ultimately I realized my job more than another job is to show people that there's a future, there's a world beyond this, that we are bigger than this that COVID, this little virus, this big virus that's so small is nothing compared to our strengths. But the only way we can see it that way is if we allow ourselves to start seeing things broad, to go deeper into the ocean. When you look at an ocean, all you see on the surface is water. You go a little deeper and you see what the sages say that whatever is on dry land is on the sea and even more. You see universes. We know less about the deep sea than we know about outer space. Because all the sea does, S-E-A, not S-E-E, -E, what the sea does is, is it covers over a universe that unless you know that you want to look there and you have the skills to look there and you have the materials that will allow you to look there, this will be invisible to you. And it's the same thing with vision in life, to really see, not to look. To look is to just, okay, I'm looking at a wall in front of me. I'm looking, I see a window, I see this, I see things. I, I, or rather, I look at things. I see, I have vision, I'm looking deeper. To look beyond the surface. It's not only about, is there an alcohol ban or is there no alcohol ban? It's not only about corrupt politicians and non-corrupt politicians. There's so much more to the story, my friends. Something huge is happening, huge. We've never been through this in, in, in history, at least in recent history. The modern world has never focused on such a thing. We've never seen anything like this. This is beyond. We can't just get carried away when the alcohol ban goes or when lockdown is more serious or now the new nine to four can't go out. It can't be that my friends. Yes, we have to care about details, but we also have to be bigger than the details. We have to see that the world is changing and much of that change will only happen based on you and me. It's not changing and I'm out of control and it's just changing in front of me. I can be part of that change. I can lead that change. I can decide how I'm going to come out and my family out of this thing in the future. The first lesson Rabbi Yochanan and Zakai tells us Yes, I'm so sad the temple's been destroyed. Judaism, the way I know it, is over. But I don't have time to feel sorry for myself. I have to go to Yavne and sit down with some brilliant people and figure out how I can keep this religion alive, not only alive, more vibrant than ever. 
because it's only since the destruction of the temple that we have pretty much all of Jewish scholarship, the Talmud, the Mishnah, Halakha, mysticism, Kabbalah, all that stuff is post-temple era. Oh, some people knew those traditions, but it was never transcribed, it was never accessible, it was never studied. The yeshiva world, the idea of shiurim, so much of what we consider part and parcel of Judaism was constructed in the minds of a few individuals who realized that we cannot afford during this moment of destruction to only mourn. We also have to have the vision to build forward. Number one. Number two, which leads up from number one. Are you a forest person who sees? In other words, do you see the forest or do you only see a tree because you feel? What do I mean? There's time for feelings and there's times for vision. A lot of the things that we think about life are not actually thought out. They're feelings. I feel that way. The problem with feelings are that they often are illogical and dangerous. I feel scared. Why? Let's talk about it. I feel overwhelmed. Okay, I have compassion for that, but let's talk about it. Why? The world is changing too fast. Okay, and why does that scare you? And what did we think about life till this happened? That everything was stable? Wasn't that just a fiction? Too many of our decisions are based on feelings. Feelings have a beautiful part of life. They allow us to have love. They allow us to have fear when we need it. They allow us to have relationships. They allow us to have compassion. They allow us to, 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 to engage with this world. But only when they are the tool of the mind, when the mind, which is supposed to have clarity, which is supposed to be objective, and see big, as we said previously, controls the heart. Again, Rabbi Yochanan Mazake could not afford at that time to focus on his grief, as did Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, we're told, he was walking past the temple after it was destroyed, and he's smiling. And the sages say, we're crying and you're smiling, and he says, just like, kept, just like God kept his promise that it will be destroyed, God will keep his promise and he will rebuild it. And they turn to him and say, Akiva nichamtanu, Akiva, you comforted us. Akiva nichamtanu, Akiva, you comforted us. In other words, yes, my heart is sore, but I'm remembering the words of the prophets. The same prophets who said the destruction is going to happen said that we're going to get there. Said that there's a Mashiach. Said that there's a third temple. Ezekiel, his whole prophecy is about the third temple. It's going to happen. In other words, I don't lose my grounding. I don't lose the forest from a tree. That famous expression, you know, seeing the forest for the trees. Yes, there's beautiful trees in front of you if you're looking at the screen. Beautiful trees. And there's nothing wrong with sitting and reflecting on the beauty of one tree or two trees. But don't forget there's a forest. So there's a road. We're going somewhere. This world is not a jungle. There's a manual, there's a creator, there's a guide, there's a visionary, there's a, cre there's a creator of heaven and earth, there's Hashem who has a plan. And that faith has to control me, even when my emotions are all over the place. I'm not saying we never lose control of emotions, but even when we're in a very emotional state, let's remember this isn't reality, it's just what I'm feeling. And that's not the time then to go vent on Facebook. And it's not the time to sit there burning relationships. Your feelings, fine, you're feeling. But don't allow that to dictate your life. Allow the mind to play its role. Faith, clarity. The gift of clarity. That's what the mind offers us. The heart has no clarity. The heart is a mess. It's a jumble, it's all over the place, it's emotional, it's erratic. 
it's great as long as we don't take it too seriously. The gift of vision, the gift of clarity, to see in this mess, we don't know everything. I don't have clarity about everything that's going on, but I have clarity that better days are coming. I don't know how, but I know they're coming. I know Mashiach is gonna come. I don't know when, but I believe today. I know that God is good and will do what needs to be done in the best way possible. I know that humanity and its heart is good and will solve itself eventually. I believe this stuff. And that gives me, even in a moment when I see madness, I see radicalism, I see the opposite of clarity. My clarity reminds me to be grounded, to stay focused, to remember who is in charge. And that leads to the third point. What you can do, do. What you can't, leave to God. I think that's very self obvious. It talks for itself. I remember one time I heard an expression. They told me, lady, the globe on your shoulder is getting a bit too heavy to carry. Why don't you shrug and let it fall off? Some of us feel like we carry the world on our shoulders and the answer is just shrug, let it fall. In other words, you're not carrying the world. Who are you kidding? We can barely carry ourselves. We can't carry our kids. We can't carry our spouse. Let go. I mean, it's a basic principle of Alcoholic Anonymous. Dear God, Give me the courage to change what can be changed. The serenity to accept that which cannot. And the wisdom to know the difference between the two. What a great line. What a great line. The wisdom to know the difference between the two. All too often, we're stressing about things that are beyond our control. COVID right now, unless you are the top medical professionals, are you developing a vaccine? 99% of what's going out there has totally out of your control. There's very little you could vent about and scream about that's gonna change much. So leave that to God or to whoever else is dealing with it. Basically allow things to happen unless you wanna become a virologist very quickly and figure something out. And during that time, at least, Keep yourself sane. I've been signing off a lot of my messages during this time. Stay safe, stay sane. And I'm more worried about the sane than the safe. I think many people are losing their minds. I'm not talking about the mental illness way, which that unfortunately is happening as well. I'm talking about healthy people with healthy brains who are literally driving themselves insane through panic, fear, phobias, conspiracies, it's not our job to run this world. There's an expression in the Talmud. It talks about you know, a vineyard that's being destroyed. And at some stage it says, let the owner of the vineyard come and solve his own problems. Yavo bal hakerem. Let the owner of the vineyard come and solve this issue. There are too many issues over here that are out of your control. So panicking what the world's gonna look like in six months is out of your control. Panicking, are you going to be able to go visit your kid in America in eight months? It's out of your control. It's out of your control. I don't know when I'm going to see my mother next. It's out of my control. But what's in my control is my own sanity. It's my own values. It's my own peace. It's my own relationships. It's my own relationships that I'm building overseas because I cannot see people in person for the next untold future. But I'm not saying we can't grieve. It's sad that I can't go overseas. But it can't be I'm living in grief. I can't live like that. Because if all I did during COVID was felt sorry for myself, I wasted a crisis. And the worst thing we could do in a challenging time is to waste a crisis. Every business leader knows that. You can reconstruct your whole business in a crisis. It's a very basic principle of business 
never waste a crisis. It's a basic principle of life. Never waste a crisis. This can be the realignment you need in your life. This could be the realignment that I need in my life. If only I allow it to. Next, search for wisdom. Rabbi Yochanan Matzakai and the sages, what they did is they started creating what in 200 years after that would be created the Mishnah, which the Mishnah then led to the Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud, which led to all of Jewish scholarship. In other words, now that we don't have a temple, it's going to be the wisdom that guides us. It's going to be in our own mind. We're going to create temples in each Jew's mind. We're going to create reservoirs of inspiration within the mind. You see, the difference between knowledge and emotion, between the brain and the heart, there's many differences. But a difference that we didn't talk about yet, knowledge, I could take wherever I go. For example, I'm teaching you something tonight. Hopefully, you're learning a thing or two. Shut down the computer in half an hour. And now the knowledge is with you. Oh, you might not be conscious of it. You might have to dig in and remember. You might watch it again, but it's going to be then with you. Emotions, on the other hand, they have a very short lifespan. And pretty much when you're in the moment, you're at the wedding, you're enjoying yourself. After the wedding, you might have a memory of that, but ultimately, first of all, it's in your mind. Second of all, you'll never feel that emotion again. You see, because emotion is very much based on others. It's based on where you're at. So the temple life was an emotional experience. We're told in the Talmud, whoever never saw the temple, never saw true beauty, inspiration. It was magnificent. It was miraculous. It was incredible. But the moment you walked out of the temple, it was all over, pretty much. That's why you have to come three times a year back to the temple to just try to re-inspire you. But with an idea, one idea could change your life forever. One idea that you process and make your own. One idea that you transform and make a personal can change your life forever. You could take it with you wherever you want to go. You can bring it with you wherever you want to be. You can move to the other side of the planet, as many Jewish communities did, and bring it with you. The wisdom, Jewish knowledge. How did South African Jewry recreate the shtetl here in South Africa? You had a bunch of knowledgeable people who came over from the shtetl and decided to recreate a world over here because the world was in their mind. Yes, it then played out in a shul, in a mikvah, in a UOS, whatever, a chev. But fundamentally, what they were doing is they were recreating a Jewish world from their minds because Judaism is now in the mind. And once it's in the mind, you could take it anywhere. Why do you think the Nazis, before they killed Jews, they burned books? Because if you kill Jewish wisdom, you kill Judaism. If you kill the mind, if you kill collective Jewish memory, if you take away Jewish education from Jews, then Judaism has no future. If a Jewish kid knows Shema Yisrael, if a Jewish kid knows how to open a Siddur, if a Jewish kid knows what a bar mitzvah is and a bat mitzvah is and they know what it means, Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, then you have a chance for a future. Ignorance is the biggest threat. And yes, we want our kids to have positive Jewish experiences and have feel-good experiences and come to shul and enjoy it. That's great. But if it's not complemented with knowledge, that experience will eventually evaporate. And all too often, that's what we see we losing Jews because we're giving a lot of Jews nice experiences. They're going to Israel. They're going to Holocaust education, but that's all emotional. But what do they know? Do they know there was an Avram and a Yitzchak and a Yaakov and a Sarah and a Rivka and a Rachel and a Leah and a Beit HaMikdash and a temple and Jerusalem and a destruction and the great sages and a Talmud and a Chumash? That's the meat and bones of who we are. Same in our lives today in COVID. We have to be digging for wisdom. We have to be asking, what now? What's my lessons? 
what am I learning? Am I upgrading myself? Because if I'm only relying on inspiration from here and there, I come once a week to a nice share which inspires me. But I'm not there for the knowledge, I'm just there to feel good. Inspiration has a very short shelf life. Inspiration is expiration. Inspire leads to expire. Inspiration doesn't last much. But an idea, if I change my thinking, if I allow myself to reconstruct the way I see this world, ah, and I've achieved wisdom. And then you can put me in any world and I'll survive. One of the, one of the great Jews last century spent a lot of time in a Soviet gulag and they asked him how he survived. And he said, what do you mean? I knew the whole mission in my brain. So I would just study. I didn't have a mission in front of me. I didn't have a Talmud in front of me, but I had a good memory and I studied hard before. And I literally, went back into Talmud in my mind. So he's sitting in a gulag and the Soviets think they control him. And ultimately, where is he right now? He's in a yeshiva, a debate between sages, Abaya Rava, 1500 years ago. That's where he's at. Because when you have a mind, you are everywhere at any time. When you have an imagination, you are anywhere. The power of the mind. You could be in hell and believe you're in heaven. And you could be in heaven and believe you're in hell. Like I always tease the South African Jews, you're, South Africa is heaven where people think they're in hell. And when people die, I believe they come up to heaven and God sits them down and takes them to Cape Town. And they're like, one second, but that's South Africa. And he's like, yeah, what did you think it was? I said, I thought it was hell. He says, let me show you, it was really heaven. <laughs> because it's all in your mind. And ultimately, if you decide that the life you're living is heaven, which I, I, I actually believe it is, then it is. How, power is your, how powerful is your knowledge? How powerful is your imagination? Because you could honestly be in heaven and think you're in hell. Believe me. I remember hearing a story from a friend of mine who was teaching a barmy boy. And this kid had just come back for a bar mitzvah trip, I think, from New Zealand. This kid was living in the United States. And it was in a private jet. <laughs> and he was devastated, absolutely devastated. And he's sitting across uh, his barmy teacher and he's saying how devastated he is. He says, there's only one bed on the plane and mom took it and I had to sleep in a chair. Now, what's going through your mind? What a spoiled brat. But I'm thinking to myself, for his universe, he's very much like <laughs> many of us. You're in heaven and you think you're in hell because all you focus on is the, the challenge, or the, the, even who would consider the challenge, sit on one of those gorgeous seats. Besides wisdom, we need ritual. What the rabbis orchestrated is that they created the Jews day, davening, customs, wash your hands, do this, say this. It's not because the rabbis want to be dictators. That's often one of the big misconceptions. Judaism originally wasn't this ritualistic. What they felt was, if I can create ritual and structure and familiarity, it feels safe. As human beings, you know it from your kids, we need structure. We need familiar. So coming each time, going to shul, sitting in your same seat, unless there's somebody else sitting there and then it's, you don't have to push them out. Going, listening to this, having the Rosh Hashanah dinner, having the Pesach Seder, have all these experiences, all these rituals, they create a universe. It's a Jewish universe. That's why when a, when a person wants to convert into Judaism, most bad things make them go through at least one year, if not two years of Jewish life. Not because they need 24 months of study necessarily. If the guy, has, the guy or the girl have a great IQ, they can figure it out in a month. I need you to live like a Jew for a year. I want you to live through a Pesach. Go live in that house and see how Pesach is lived. Go through a Shabbos and see how a Shabbos is lived. Go see how a Yom Kippur is celebrated because you know it from the books, but you don't know what Yom Kippur feels like. Go feel it together with somebody else. 
He'll sit and watch Jewish children running around and show. Go shake a lulav. Go just read about it. Knowledge is great, but it has to break down into ritual. And stop seeing mitzvahs as dictatorships. They're just a framework. Every job, every universe, an army, a choir, a, a group of actors, everybody has their rituals. That's the way you do things. That's the only way to run anything. You create systems of safety where people feel safe and familiar. And I would say during COVID, keep as many of the rituals as possible. Rosh Hashanah this year is going to be so unfamiliar, my friends. Unless a miracle happens, you're not going to be in shul this Rosh Hashanah, and neither am I. Hopefully, we'll be able to hear the shofar somewhere. Rosh Hashanah dinners is going to be lonely, not with, not with families. And that's why I'm trying, and I, I know many other rabbis are trying to see how we, we could create as much familiar as possible within this craziness. To create within your home a mini shul, a machzor, a tomb, an emotion, an experience, so that you can feel safe. Each home has its own rituals. It's amazing. You know, I'm in my mid-30s. <clears throat> my siblings, some of them are 20 years younger than me. I never grew up together. By the time they were two years old, I was out of the house. By the time they were five, I was married. And yet, we grew up in the same homes. Same home. Literally, I moved to the house when I was three, and my mom still lives in the same house. So you come there, and you actually start realizing, because you grew up in the same space by the same parents, even though it was 20 years apart, you have a lot in common. And you fall into the rituals of the home. You fall into the style. And like you, 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 you're in a time warp of 20 years ago. I remember a woman was telling me, not, not in South Africa, it was a Rebbitson somewhere. We were having a conversation. I was still a teenager. And she was telling me her husband comes from uh, down under, Australia. And she says, when my husband goes to Australia together with his brothers, and they're all successful rabbis all around the world, they become like kids again. She's like, it's embarrassing. <laughs> The same fights that they had when they were six. It's like a ritual. That's like the ritual of the home. You fought that home, and that's why you, you fall right back into that, what's called, I believe, in psychology, social conditioning. You just get conditioned into that world. Try to create within this madness some sort of ritual and familiarity. Be bold. You know what be bold means? Make courageous decisions. Make those decisions that maybe, like I said before, in another time of a crisis, you wouldn't make. I'll give you an example. You've been locked into the house for four months. Why don't you just take on Shabbos? Pretty much the only difference between keeping Shabbos and COVID and not is the phone or the TV. You're not driving anywhere. Shops are pretty much closed. You're staying home anyway. Keep the phone off for 25 hours. Stay off Facebook. 25 hours. Make big changes in your life, which aren't that big in this time, relatively, compared to the biggest change you've made. You've gone from a social shopping individual to a homebound hermit. Reminds me of the joke about the... <clears throat> The hermit who jo joins a group of hermits, and the, the, the custom is that you could come and say two words every 10 years. So 10 years are in, and this hermit turns to the other two hermits and says, hard bed. Okay, 10 years later, tasteless food. 10 years later, it's 30 years. Same group of guys, they've been sleeping in the same place together, turns to them and says, too noisy. And the guy looks at them and says, you've been here for 30 years and all you do is complain. 
like we're living like a bunch of hermits, okay? Um, you've changed your life in a way that you never thought you could. So why not change it spiritually? Learn more. Become a scholar. There is so much Jewish scholarship on the net. Challenge me. I'll send you 5,000 links. I mean, just the website, h.com, chabad.org. If you learned everything on those websites, which, by the way, they're all in English, you could, you could apply for a rabbinic role almost. Incredible amount of information, friends. It's bold. Just like Rabbi Yochanan who was bold and recreated what we consider Judaism. Be bold and recreate your life. Don't waste a crisis. Be flexible. I spoke about ritual. I spoke about knowledge. I spoke about a lot. Earlier today, I gave a shear and I actually sent it out a video because it was like a prelude to this shear. We need to be flexible, people. Allow ourselves to be malleable, to, to adjust, to move. Can't be rigid. Could you imagine if those rabbis sitting in the yeshiva trying to recreate Judaism were a bunch of rigid, rigid folk? They actually tell a story. Um, uh, they tell a story of how the temple was destroyed because of a rigid person. Listen to the story. Because the story goes that there was a fellow named Kamsa. Sorry. There was a, a fellow named Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. You might have heard the story. And somebody wanted to invite Kamsa because he liked Kamsa. He didn't like Bar Kamsa, but by mistake, his guard invited Bar Kamsa to the party. So, sorry, Bar Kamsa comes, um, and the sage and the, the host is furious. So he wants to kick him out, and Bar Kamsa begs him, please don't embarrass me. I'll pay for a quarter of the meal, half the meal, kicks him out anyway. Bar Kamsa is furious. He goes and tells stories to the Roman Caesar back in Rome that the Jews are out to get you. That's a story that's famous. What's not famous so much is what the Talmud continues. <clears throat> so he told them, he, he told the Romans, I'll prove you that they don't respect you. Send a sacrifice to the temple and they won't sacrifice it. So he says, okay. So the Romans prepare a nice, beautiful animal and they tell this character, Bar Kamsa, to bring it to the temple. Bar Kamsa is not an idiot. What he does is he makes a blemish in the ear of this animal, and he is now ritually, un it's not kosher to sacrifice. So he comes to the sages, and he says, sacrifice it. The sages were about to, but there was a certain scholar named Scharia, I believe, and he says, no, but the Torah says. And they're like, yeah, fine, so let's not bring it as a sacrifice. Let's just kill it. Let's tell him, no. So fine, let's at least take the animal and tell him that we did it. He says, but you're not allowed to lie. And whatever they're trying to do, whatever flexible they're trying to do, the Sechariah, Rabbi Sechariah is being stiff. So Ben Kamsa goes back and the temple's destroyed. It's one of the stories. And the, the Talmud says that the humility, but they don't mean humility, they mean the rigidity of this Zechariah destroyed the temple. And they didn't say it as a compliment. Don't be so rigid. Obviously, that is halacha Jewish law. But think out of the box and try and work. There were other sages who were willing to make a plan. Make a plan, Zechariah. No. Uh, could you imagine if Zechariah was one of those scholars then trying to figure out how to recreate Judaism for the 20, for 20 centuries? Now, you might walk out and sit there saying, oh, gosh, this rabbi is pretty much pre uh, preaching. Let's all drop religion and ch change religion. I'm not saying that. No, you could have a long beard and still be bold. In other words, bold doesn't mean that you become an absolute, you know, liberal and you start changing everything. No. Change from within. Think about all the changes that's happened to Judaism in the last hundred years. Women's education outreach. It's all happened within the Orthodox world. People will criticize the Orthodox world and say they're not moving fast enough, but 
if you compare even Judaism in the last hundred years, the decisions they had to make, many of them very bold. Thousands of years, women didn't go to school. 1918, 1920s, a, a woman named Sarah Schneer came up with the idea of Beis Yaakov and changed the face of Jewish education forever. Now every single Jewish group sends their girls to school. Outreach, the Lubavitcher Rebbe started in the 1940s and 1950s. The Orthodox world went against. Today, everybody believes you have to do it. You could be bold within halacha and transform to the face of Judaism from a Judaism that's insular. We now have a Judaism that's accepting. From a Judaism that looked at non-religious Jews as second class, we have a Judaism that looks at respect at each other and doesn't feel self-righteous. We can be bold, friends. We can be bold. We need to be bold. We don't have a choice. Big picture thinking, times for feeling and time for vision. Leave to Hashem what he needs to do. Wisdom and learning, ritual, bold decision-making, and be flexible. Those are some of the lessons from one of our darkest times. But I truly believe that's one of the greatest lessons we can learn in our life. I hope and I pray that what I shared with you tonight made its impact and resonated with you. And that in our lives, in our times, we could adopt some of these lessons and walk out of this transformative event, better people, holier nation, and a healthier universe.